Good evening. I'm Marty Goldenson in for Brian Lehrer. Tonight, a new breed of activism takes on the murderous Ugandan rebel Joseph Kony with Kony 2012, the viral video. But does, does the video have it right and do social media campaigns create a false sense of accomplishment? Also tonight, a new generation of feminists is embracing the word slut and taking the sting out of it. Sorry, Rush. Check out, we're going to check out something called MOOCs, which stands for Massive Open Online Courses, where one professor can teach 100,000 students. Goodbye, campus. We'll also consider the fate of scientific journals in the Internet age. But let's begin with women returning fire here at home. When Rush Limbaugh let loose on Georgetown law student Sandra Fluck, after she told Congress that birth control ought to be covered by health insurance, Rush called her a slut. Years ago, this might have shut her up or ruined her reputation or undermined her cause, but times change. In fact, lately, feminists have reclaimed the word slut and staged events called slut walks, designed to take the shame out of female sexuality. You do not dress down for a slut walk against rape. It's part of what some call sex-positive feminism, and it could have an impact on how sexual assault is treated under the law. Let's dig into this with two guests. Rebecca Traster is a contributor to Salon and New York Times Magazine and the author of Big Girls Don't Cry. And with us via Skype from Chicago is Deborah Turkheimer, a law professor at DePaul University. Let's start here in the studio. How did this slut walk business begin? Where, where, did, where did it start? In Canada, in, uh, in Toronto, actually, right. where uh, at a law school campus, a, a, a police officer was there talking about personal safety and advised a crowd of women um, against, and he used the word slut. He said, you know, when you're out, try to avoid dressing like a slut as a way to avoid being assaulted. Um, and this was not met with you know, an enormous amount of positivity I, I from, not. from his audience. And so a few of the students, a couple of the students, um, were so angry about this notion that they would be somehow to blame sure. for how they wore, how they, you know, how they as comported if they themselves. This as rape, if the yeah. way that you dress or, or the way that you behave invites rape. Um, and this, this does tie into something that's been discussed for many years, especially within a young feminist online culture. It's a culture that's been largely invisible to, to a lot of us for years. Um, the notion of rape culture, uh, that we live in a, in a world in which this kind of victim blaming is just considered normal. We don't even blink at it. And a couple of students decided that they wanted to stage a protest and thinking it would be a relatively small sort of student affair. Uh, they did and instead Hundreds of women showed up, and in fact, it then became a viral movement. Um, via, not, via the web. Via right. the web, right. organizing through the web, which is amazing because it's a sort of combination of an old form of activism, taking to the streets, right. doing a kind of theatrical right. protest. It's spread that way. Yeah, it's, but it's spread through a very new form of activism, which is online right. activism. Right. Um, it and went it, to other countries. It was around right? the world. It was around the world, and some of the slut walks were huge and sort of stopped traffic. Some of them have been very small, quite modest. Right. Um, but but. This summer especially, it was the sort of visible form of young feminist activism. Let, let me stop you and, and bring uh, Deborah Turkheimer into this. Uh, Deborah, why do you think this is an important movement? You, you've written that it's the most significant feminist initiative in decades. Talk to us. Well, what's interesting about the movement is it's pushing cultural change on two fronts. At one and the same time, it embraces female sexuality and it protests rape and it ties the two together in ways that I think are really without precedent and um, open up some really exciting possibilities for law reform. Dr draw the connection there uh, be between the legal issue and the, the sort of sex positive feminism. Well, what the women who are participating in Slut Walk are saying is that they want sex without rape and they want sexuality without judgment. And the way the law is currently configured, they are not getting that. Um, and I say that because the rape paradigm is stranger rape, stranger rape in an alley with a knife. And that's not the kind of rape that most women are experiencing. The women who are participating in Slut Walk are 
uh, talking about violation by acquaintances, by their intimates, by non-strangers. Date rape. The law, well, well, date rape in some instances, and in some instances, um, what's going on looks very little like like a date. Um, and I'm thinking in particular about um, hookup culture on college campuses. They aren't necessarily dating, but they do know these people, and and these are the people in many instances who are. Uh, sexually assaulting the women who are speaking out in this slut walk movement. The law is not responding to that kind of rape for the most part. It's 90%, according to a recent study that the CDC just issued. And yet, for the most part, that kind of rape goes unnoticed by the law. The The paradigm is is not what the law is responding to. And and I think that that needs to, to be reformed. Yeah, we'll get back to the legal part in a minute because I want to talk about the force and law reform and some changes that have happened. But I want to get to the kernel of what excites you about about this, what, what's positive about it. Is it that in the past, uh, do you see feminism, and either of you can chime in on this, um, uh, sort of played down the sexuality of women in order, in a way, to not be seen as, as objectified, which was, of course, the great objection of the women's movement when it restarted in the 70s? Go ahead. I <laughs> I'm sorry. What's exciting to me is that the the, the two um, the two trends are being connected. So the recognition that non-stranger rape is a real problem, and the recognition that women should be able to enjoy sexual freedom without that kind of judgment. And what the slut walk movement does is bring those two trends together. Um, and these women are insisting that um, for for the for victim blaming to go on is inconsistent with the kind of sexual freedom that women should be able to enjoy. And so the, the aims have to advance together, the aims being um, recognition that sexual freedom is important and that, that women deserve not to be raped by people who, who, who they know. Yeah, chime in here, well, Rebecca. With, with regard to your question about the reputation of the second wave right. movement, about the 1970s feminism, uh, second wave feminism was also was often tagged by its ideological foes as being in some way anti-sex. Now, there were conversations that took place within feminism, sure. for example, over pornography, where you have people like Catherine McKinn and Andrea Dworkin, um, but they were fighting other, oh, sex positivity is actually a term that's been around for a very long time right. in the feminist movement. Um, people like Ellis, El Ellen Willis were-, were Sexual liberation. Of, exactly. So, so feminism as it actually existed was not at all anti-sex. However, um, feminism has very successfully been tarred. Um, its reputation has been tarred by its ideological foes over the past few decades. And so what you have is a sort of inaccurate and dim memory of second wave feminism as being somehow anti-sex. And I think that is something that younger women want to uh, shake off. Not, right. not necessarily the history, since I don't think the history really backs up that, that assessment of feminism, but certainly the reputation. And th this is why I assume that Rush Limbaugh's insult of, of Sandra Fluke mm -hmm or a fluck, as I should pronounce mm -hmm. it, I think, um, w resonated and caused an instant response nationwide because it was a it seemed to me a direct insult at the sexuality of young middle class women. Is that right? Yes. Well, I think one of the things that <laughs> it's interesting. I've been thinking and writing a lot about the nature of Limbaugh's attack on, on Fluck. One of yes. the things to remember is that she did not make any reference in her testimony to her sex life, right? So the, it's a funny thing how this has become about sex positivity when, in fact, one of the things that Fluck was there to test, the things that te Fluck was testifying about had to do with um, economics, had to do with uh, policy with health care policy. Um, it, she wasn't talking about sex, and, and she wasn't talking about the sex lives of the other students on whose behalf she was speaking, right? So, so the fact of it becoming a discussion about sex positivity plays into this an enthusiasm an enthusiasm for this kind of for this discussion and this line of thinking, especially amongst young women. But I also don't want to lose the fact that this is not actually we're not actually talking about Sandra Fluck's sex life. She was never talking about the sex life. But what it What's interesting to me about Limbaugh's attack on it is that it was a way, and if you listen to it all mashed up, a website, yes. Think Progress, has done it all mashed oh, up they? together. Yes. Um, you hear him talking again and again about these co-eds, which sort of tells you exactly where his sure. where his brain is yes. in the mid-20th century. Yes, co-education. Yes, yes. <laughs> Remember so the, progressive. The, the yeah. exotic new yeah, frontier in education. Frontier, right. And um, he talks about how they just want to have sex without limits, without limits, without control. And I think that... The, his sexualizing of the situation mm -hmm. actually was 
was a kind of response to this idea of liberated womanhood in lots of forms, that women can be in law school, that they can testify in front of Congress, yes. or as the case was, be excluded, their testimony could be excluded from a congressional <laughs> hearing. But, but I think um, the sexualization was a move that he made sort of standing in for his resentments of a kind of vision of limitless right. independent well, womanhood right. in all other yeah. in all which, kinds of other realms. Which has its sexual underpinnings as well. Uh, Deborah, you're nodding during this. T tell us your reaction well, here. I, I guess I guess my perspective on it is very similar. Um, what I would say is that Rush Limbaugh's line was drawn in a in a place that people reacted to very strongly because it seemed outrageous and it seemed ridiculous that this woman's comments had somehow defined her as a slut. Um, but, it, but I think the larger question is why we're judging women at all for their behavior that is perceived as sexual or maybe is sexual, and, and, and how we uh, form those judgments and why those judgments have significance. And so even though the, yes. the, the, the context is very different, I do think it connects to what this slut walk, slut walk movement is, is attempting to do. And certainly from, you know, from, from where I sit, it raises these larger questions about why female sexuality is being judged at all. Can you draw a, a legal or a feminist line um, all the way back to Anita Hill on this? Is that, is that, is that question for me? Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> it's the legal question. Yeah, well, well, you know, again, I think, I think that, this, that the line that gets drawn is the line that connects women who have spoken out in ways that, uh, that, that mark them as perhaps um, experiencing lives, sexual lives that are perceived as, as deviant in some way. And what's interesting is that the law, the criminal law, does this in various forms as well. I think that the slut walk movement has not targeted law. And I think that in some respects that's really important to do because female sexuality is being defined in part by, by the law and by the ways in which rape law uh, responds to or doesn't respond you're, to. You're, you're, yeah, this is great, but I think I need an, a, an example here to, to grasp it. The law, most rape law says that it's not rape unless there's force, right? That's right. And you can't, there, you can't bring in the sex life, the previous sex life of the woman, uh, and, but, you, but except for certain circumstances that are, quote, deviant, right? Right. So, so these are two separate issues, but I think they, they both uh, relate to the point that I'm making. So one is that in most places, rape is defined as forcible intercourse. It's not non-consensual intercourse. The slut walk participants are, are saying that consent matters and that sex without consent is rape and it should count as rape. That's not how the law defines rape. And so I see the potential here for rape law reform to bring the law in conformity with what I hope is emerging as some kind of consensus that, in fact, non-consensual intercourse is what is rape. That's, it, uh, that's are, there, are there rape laws, do you think, I know there's a lot written about this in the academy, but do you think they're on the edge of any kind of reform or headed in that, that, in that direction? Well, I, I am encouraged by what's going on around, around this country and around the world, and that's where I see the, the slut walk movement as being very much a force for this kind of legal change that scholars have been talking about for quite some time. The other piece that you had mentioned was uh, the sexual history of women who allege that they've been raped. And when that history is, is perceived as deviant in some way, it's, it's allowed in evidence and women are judged by it, very much tying into the rape culture that Rebecca mentioned earlier. Rebecca, do you respond, wanted to respond to that? And then well, I have a question for you. I, I wanted to specifically respond to your Anita Hill question because mm -hmm. I see such tremendous echoes. And of course, the this past fall, when Slut Walks was actually really kind of at its height, mm -hmm. was the 20th anniversary of Anita Hill's testimony in mm -hmm. front of Congress about the sexual harassment that she claimed that she experienced while working with Clarence Thomas, who was then a Supreme Court nominee. Um, and it's very fascinating because many of the optics are very similar. There are all kinds of different issues happening at that point having to do with race, having to do with gender and power. Um, it was 20 years ago, we were still getting used to the idea of, of uh, we still are getting used to the idea of powerful women. Um, but one of the things that happened to Anita Hill is, A, there, there were these optics of an all-male panel. I don't know if you remember this, but it was it was something that prompted the election of a lot of women in 1992. It was called the Year of the Women. Um, yes, the election. It, yes, because there was such anger at looking at this congressional panel headed actually by Joe Biden and seeing this line of white guys just absolutely grilling 
um, a woman, Anita Hill, on her testimony on her personal life. Um, and this is something that I thought of when I saw Sandra Fluck mm. and the optics of the Daryl Issa panel that were also, it was this all-guy panel of clergymen, and Sandra Fluck was excluded, as was Carol Keehan, the head of the Catholic Hospital Association. Um, and, and I think it stirred a lot of the same reactions. And interestingly, Anita Hill was also labeled by a conservative uh, pundit at the time, David Brock, a little bit nutty and a little bit slutty. It was a very famous line used against her. So it was another... He took it back, right? He did. He has since re reformed. He's, <laughs> he is, he's changed his ideology. But, um, but it was this example of trying to denigrate um, a woman by sexually, but by tagging her sexually um, in a dismissive way for things that actually had nothing to do either with what she was testifying about and, and not with what Sandra Fluck was testifying about. Yes, but of course it's always lurking underneath, as I said before. I have a question for both of you, and we can, we can start um, certainly with Deborah, which is, are you surprised, given the recent, I guess you'd have to call them attacks on women, in the sense that there's, you know, the lessening of health care, the contraception issue, the abortion issue, all that stuff about women's freedom and reproductive freedom in their bodies, um, and, um, and vaginal ultrasound, I mean, all of it. Are you surprised that, uh, that people, women, aren't out on the streets? They are. Um, in, re in a quick response to that, you're saying they are? They are. Oh, what happened in Virginia was an example. If you have seen the protests uh, several, probably three weeks ago, um, as the transvaginal ultrasound bill was going to the desk of the governor, who was going to sign it and become a very popular vice presidential candidate, right. um, there, was a, there was a protest, a rally of 2,000 women in a blizzard in Virginia. Um, and it was really one of the... It, you know, I think there is a question about how much coverage we're seeing. There have since been multiple, and it, it, I think that... I remember that coverage. I don't remember it being so large. That rally, I think I have the numbers right. I'd have to fact check it. Sure. But it was, in my mind, it was 2,000 women in a blizzard. I really got that stuck. Mm. And there have been other sort of old-fashioned on state house steps protests, not just in Virginia, but in Texas and Idaho, um, all in all kinds of places where these laws are being passed. And you're also seeing some other kinds of old-fashioned activism, that the boycotts, the voting with dollars, as in the co co when the Komen Foundation cut off its funds to Planned Parenthood. Right, that's a form, too. Right, protest. so that's another kind of protest that we recognize more easily. Had, yeah, so there have been a couple of reversals there, right yes. there. Yes. Yeah. Deborah, did you want to respond also to that? I, I just wanted to say that I, I, I think that there is political clout here as well that's, that's being... Um, yes. You know, that's being galvanized, and I, and I think we're going to see that in, in the elections to come. Yes, I see it. Um, sort of underlying, you know, all this is where is the women's movement now? And, uh, you know, I have a couple daughters and they take for granted a lot of things that their mom did not take for granted, that they would have to, that they would go to work, that they would have a place in the society. Um, they also see, and both of them are aware of these issues, uh, how in some ways the women's movement has not gone anywhere. The equal pay for equal work. There's they're still waiting for. The, the who takes care of the kids, um, all kinds of issues. I was wondering whether this sort of new um, direction of positive, sex positive feminism is in some ways the, the cutting edge of maybe another rebirth of feminism. Yes. That will sort of finish the job. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think we get into trouble, and this is precisely the root of your question, um, is really, we like to tell ourselves a, a series of sort of feel-good narratives in this country that, that because of the women's movement, because of the upheav upheavals of, of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, we fixed our racism, we fixed our sexism, we fixed our homophobia. It's done. We tell ourselves History is a dialectic. Stories. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> It right? does not work that way. And I think that's something we have to tell ourselves because we do like to operate in a soundbite culture where we either have to assess, we have to take the temperature and say, it worked or it didn't work, rather than, Wow, we're about 50 years into the most recent iteration, most powerful iteration of a women's movement. We only have a second left, so I have to cut you off and just get a final word from Deborah on this same I, thought. I, I'll just say that I, I do think that feminism is 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 becoming perhaps newly relevant to a generation of women. I you know I teach uh, law students who take my feminist jurisprudence course, and and this is speaking to them in ways that that I think um, bode well for the future. Thanks very much. We're out of time. Thanks Thank for coming you. to both of Thank you. Thank you. Still to come tonight, the viral video, Coney 2012, Deconstructed. Lisa Shannon, who founded Run for Congo Women, the, cl the global classroom, one professor and 100,000 students, and right after this break, the internet versus the high-priced scientific journal.
Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. To find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY leads. CUNY leads to the career I always wanted. Well, I first started skating with my friend. He had an extra board, and then he just gave it to me, and I've been skating ever since. Well, when I don't learn a trick and I have my mind set on something and I'm not getting what I want, I just keep going for it until I get it right. She didn't go to college, so she wants me to experience that whole thing, and so I could end up getting, like, a good job. Ah! I think to get into college, I'll have to be determined, just like when I want to get a new trick, and skating's helped me realize I've got what it takes. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Who owns knowledge? In the networked age, it's a question that's taken on new urgency. When scientists can instantly share their work on the web, what is the function of scientific journals? How can journals continue to turn a profit and keep going, and should they? Here with me now to take a look at copyright and science is Nancy Scola. She's a journalist who's written about this issue for the American Prospect magazine. Been here many times before. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. So this seems like a real abstract issue about mm -hmm. science and copyright and stuff. So let's follow the buck to begin. Okay. Um, unlike the rest of the world that, of printed publishing that seems to be going belly up, you can make money in scientific and medical publishing, oh, right? It's a, it's a good business, actually. <laughs> the publishers do very well with it, and it sort of points to some of the issues that scientists raise about, the, about this scientific publishing model, is that it is so profitable, be, profitable because you have a very set audience in the scientific community. You have a set um, base of customers in the universities that regularly purchase these bundled right, you, and journals. And they're expensive, right, to, get, to buy scientific journals? They're quite expensive. They're quite expensive individually, and very often the scientific publishers bundle them so that in order to get a very high-profile journal, like, say, Cell, you have to purchase another sort of lower tier of journals. So, to get okay, so longer. I'm a scientist. I, I'm studying layers of the eye or something, and I okay. want to publish something, and I I want to advance my career, right? So Absolutely. I put it in a, the most prestigious juried publication that I can, and I get it into this publication. Yes. And that publication is profit-making usually, right? Uh, very often, yes. Very the, often profit-making. Yes. And, and one of the big companies would be, for example? Uh, Elsevier is sort of the proxy for all the scientific journals in this conversation because they publish 2,000 different um, What's their profit journals. margin? Uh, Thirty-six percent was the most recent. Oh, that's good. That so they're doing okay. Yes. That, that's very good. Okay, so uh, so they sell it. Suppose I do that work and I'm funded by the National Institutes of Health. Do I have to? Uh, can I, do I have to put it out on on the web? It's paid for with the people's money. Yep. This is the point of contention. This is why this issue is in the news now. Is because the National Institutes of Health, which funds something like twenty-five billion dollars worth of scientific biomedical research every year. They, they established a policy a couple years back through Congress, through an act of Congress, so that if you get one dollar of NIH funding, a copy of your final published manuscript, the manuscript before it actually the, is published by the publisher, so this is the way they sort of get around some of the copyright questions. It's probably it's a hardly final, different at all. It's, right? it's, it, sometimes it, it's absent uh, a few charts and graphs. That's right. pretty much okay. the difference. It has to be. But, finish that thought. So they, they have to take a copy of that, submit it to the National Institutes of Health, to a database called PubMed Central, so that there's a free copy available online for the public. There is a one-year buffer period, so that if you need the journal article right away, uh, you're not going to get it. And that sort of gives the publisher a chance to recoup some of their investment. Okay. So 
Then comes this idea to pass a law to make it, make, to tell me if I understand this right, to restrict the government from restricting publication. Is that right? So, so since 2007, this is when the NIH policy went into effect, the publishers have, have objected to it all along. Finally, this year, they got a bill before Congress that would restrict what NIH is doing. It would say that no federal agency can command a scientist who gets government money to submit a copy of, these, of their work to a public um, online resource. And it was sort of a fire break. The idea was to stop this policy of open access, of public access, from spreading to other federal agencies. Was it about to spread? Yes. So this is so th there's a lot of sort of legislative back and forth on this. In 2010, there was the America Competes Act, which was a bill that had a provision that said, okay, this seems to be working fairly well in NIH. How do we go about expanding this to other agencies? That's when the publishers really started to get a little bit. What worried. happened to that bill? That bill actually was interesting. It was right after the fights about SOPA and PIPA, which were the online copyright bills. Um, people sort of, you know, once those bills went down, they kind of turned their fire on, on this bill. And the, uh, the two co-sponsors of it, which was uh, Darrell Issa, who's a congressman, Republican congressman from California, Carolyn Maloney. From right said, here. Right here. Uh, they were the co-sponsors. They said, you know what? This is getting too hot. We're going to back off a bit. It's done its job. It's raised the issue. And the publisher said the same thing they backed off to. Right. What arguments did they use? That, that this should be restricted. We need to, we need to keep our uh, journals alive and funded. Uh, you know, why did they say that was important? Well, they, you know, they make the argument that they hold copyright. The copyright is very often conveyed from the author to the journal uh, at the point of publication. They hold copyright, and this is the federal government interjecting themselves into a private commercial relationship. And in order for their journals to succeed, they need to have the ability to recoup what they claim is their investment in the work. You know, something else is behind this, and I can hear scientists, you know, who happen to be watching the show saying, hey, wait a minute. It's different if you put it out on the web. It's, then, then it's not judged by you know, peer review. The, the purpose of these journals uh, is to make sure that science advances in a rigorous way. Absolutely. So is it a, a dangerous trend that there is all of this, which I assume is now huge, right, the amount of publishing on the web? Yeah. Right? Is, that a, is that a dangerous trend that it's in some ways not vetted? Sure. The point to be careful about is just because that there has to be a public copy that this is the publishing mechanism mm -hmm. is the internet doesn't mean this isn't the blogging of the scientific world. This doesn't mean that there's no editing, there's no vetting, there's no public, you know, sort of colleagues, you know, judging each other's work. Just because we're divorcing the, me the for profit mechanism for recouping the scientific publisher's investment doesn't mean that this is just, you know, all bets are off and anybody can publish anything they want. There's still plenty of mechanisms for vetting, um, right. doing peer review. So, some scientists have said they're not going to go work with Elsevier, not going to publish with yeah. this large company. What, what's, tell us about that. So this was a, a few years ago, I believe, it was a British mathematician named Tim Gowers who said, this is getting ridiculous. Elsevier is making too much money and being very restrictive in access to these journal articles. What if, you know, he just floated the idea of what if we stopped mm -hmm. You know, we provide the free labor, we provide mm -hmm. the free content. What if we didn't? What if we stopped, right. you know, playing, playing by their rules? Somebody put together a website called The Cost of Knowledge, and they got scientists to commit to not participate in the Elsevier peer review model or submitting content. There's 8,000. It's growing very rapidly. Every week it seems like there's a new thousand scientists signed up, and about 8,000 at this point have agreed not to work with Elsevier in any way. So what happens next? I know that El Elsevier is a big company. They won't give up, and not to pick on them. There are other companies. But I think they do contribute to campaigns, even to Maloney's campaign, I think, right? Sure. They would, you know, the cynical take on this is that they were the second largest contributor to Carolyn Maloney's campaign. And, you know, that's why they got a hearing on this bill. That's why they got her to sort of champion it in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they would make the argument that they have, their right, they have a right to be heard like anyone else has a right to be heard. It's just in the past they've dominated the conversation. There seems to be more voices now participating in that. I get it. Thanks for explaining a difficult and complex issue and making it easy to understand. My pleasure. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. As computers become more and more a part of our daily lives, people who know how to program them become increasingly important and influential. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be wonderfully democratic if hundreds of thousands of students all over the world could learn to program like they do at the elite universities? from the best computer science professors out there, like, for example, these two guys. So this is a really exciting event for us. Uh, we are launching now our new university, Udacity, and this is our very first class with David. David, what is this class all about? So welcome to the first class. This is a class that's going to introduce you to computer science, and we're going to do that by building a search engine. 
you're not expected to have any previous background in computing to take this class. It's fine if you've never programmed before, that's what you expect. And you're going to learn some of the core ideas in computer science. You're going to learn to program in a language called Python. And you're going to build a search engine that by the end of seven weeks will have all the main components of a search engine like Google in it. Learning about computing is really one of the most powerful things you can do. That computers are these amazing machines that can be programmed to do anything. And once you learn a little bit about programming, you can sort start of start to envision the power that you have, the things that you can build with computers. One of the great things about computing is that you don't really need a lot of resources to build something that can change the world. If you learn a little bit, if you have a creative idea, you can build something, you can deploy your application to millions of people on the internet, and it doesn't really take a lot of resources to do that. It just takes a little creativity and a little bit of knowledge. So David, this is really exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing your class. I'll be making occasional appearances, but I have my, teach, my own class to teach, but David will teach this wonderful class. And I think we should just dive in. Great, well, let's get started. That was David Evans of the University of Virginia and Sebastian Thrun of Stanford introducing an online course in programming offered by a company called Udacity. 100,000 students are taking the class. It's an example of Massive Open Online Course, or MOOC, and it's bringing elite instruction in computer science to the masses. Professor David Evans joins me now via Skype from Palo Alto. Thank you for having me. So, I assume that Udacity is a combination of university and audacity, is that right? Uh, that is the derivation of the name. We remove the A from the beginning of audacity, <laughs> and it also sort of sounds like a university, so that's where the name came from. Why is it audacious? Well, we want to make education free and available for everyone. And universities are, are very static, traditional places. The, the way traditional universities work um, is wonderful for the small fraction of the population that can afford it, but it really hasn't changed for uh, at least 800 years, maybe longer than that and it's becoming less and less accessible to the vast majority of the world's population. So our goal is to make the same kind of high quality education available to vastly more people by making it free and open and available on the internet. The numbers of people who sign up for these courses, um, especially out of Stanford, it's astounding, 10,000, 100,000. What's that there's, tell you? Um, I think there's tremendous interest that there are um, millions of people, and, and you know, the numbers sound high compared to traditional universities. Um, they sound low compared to the, the fraction of the world's population that we think could benefit from this. So I think we're really just getting started at this um, and figuring out better ways to serve more people. But there is tremendous demand for education. This is something that um, everyone really wants, and finding ways to deliver that to make it accessible to more and more people um, is, is what our goal is. How come you had to start uh Udacity, how come this has to come outside the university? You'd think universities would want to do this and more importantly control it so they don't lose control of the professors and their sources of income. So this is a good question. It seems like this is something that universities should have been doing already. Um, there are certainly efforts at some universities to try to make their courses more open, mm -hmm. but it's also very difficult for universities to fit this into their, their current model that um, they are sort of Built as institutions around being exclusive. Are you saying that? Are exclusive. you saying that 800 years builds up a little inertia? Is that what you're saying? Uh, you know, it, it might. You know, universities are wonderful places. I, I love universities. I, I love uh, University of Virginia that I'm affiliated with. Um, these are wonderful places. They offer students a, a really terrific experience. Um, they definitely do have a lot of inertia. It's very hard to do new things in the context of a university, um, and a lot of what they perceive as their value is by being exclusive. That by limiting the number of degrees they have by limiting the number of people who can take their courses, well, that makes them more valuable to the people who, who they do uh, award degrees to. Um, right, let's, talk, let's, talk, let's talk about the classes themselves and the teaching and how it works, because you're, you're teaching, and maybe people are picturing just you know, watching a video on YouTube or, or iTunes, uh, but this is different. How does it work? What's it look like? How does it engage people? Um, walk us through it. Right, so interaction is really important. And one of the things that you lose by being online is the ability to sort of interact in the same room with the professor who's teaching the class. Um, but we're trying to provide ways to find, to give a level, level of interaction that in many ways is better than what you would have in a traditional lecture. One of the ways we do that is every couple of minutes in the lectures, there's an embedded quiz. And so after you've watched a video, video segment of me or someone else explaining some concept, then we'll have a quiz where the students have a chance to show that they understood that by answering a question. Um, this could be a multiple choice question. It could be a question where you have to enter a number or some text. 
Um, it could even be a programming quiz. So for the introduction to computing class where students are learning about programming in the context of building a search engine, many of the quizzes are quizzes where students need to write some code to advance us towards building the search engine as well as showing that they understand what, what we've been covering. And, and you can go, as I understand it, at your own pace, right? Yes. Yeah, so you can try the quizzes as many times as you want. Um, you can get hints for some of the quizzes. You can get feedback on whether the answer is correct. Um, for many of the quizzes, you get more than that. So if, if the answer is not quite correct, but on the right track, see, I, we automatically provide some feedback that will help students. See, this, is th this strikes me as really about education, because so much education is about weeding out the kids who can't pass. You just make tougher and tougher quizzes. You can't learn it in this way at this speed. Then you're out, and you end up with a small cadre of people who understand how to write a search engine or write a program for a search engine. This is a whole different democratic model, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. We want something that's going to work for as many people as possible. Um, and by, by, you know, there, there is value to having deadlines, we think, for, for many students, but you can also do things at your own pace. Um, there, you know, ev as you watch lectures, you can go through things as many times as you want, pausing and restarting. You can try the quizzes as many times as you want. We think there is still some value in having a shared experience. So there's a community of students going through the class together, having deadlines for homeworks, having online discussion, having that experience where um, if everything's completely self-paced, uh, for many people, it's hard to stay motivated and that, to stick with things. It's easy to put off things that you can always do tomorrow until the next day. So for students who want a little more structure, we can provide that. But it's also perfectly fine to go through in a completely self-paced way. Tell me if I understand the, where the money comes in here. Because there's got to be some kind of economic model to make Udacity and other places work. Is it that you would become, your Udacity would become a kind of headhunter, which is to say you'd know which students did really well in these tests and where they lived, and you could sell that information to Google who might want to hire somebody in New Delhi? Uh, so that is, is one of the plans. Where we're certainly not going to release any information that students don't want us to release. So we're not going to tell Google where anyone lives unless they tell us they're interested in, in getting right. a but job. But that, that's part that's part of where uh, the money would come from? Potentially. So at this point, we're not too worried about revenues. We have funding to try to grow the classes to show that we can teach well this way and we can serve students well. Um, we do want to sustain ourselves and grow as a, as a company. That means having revenues. Um, and the best model, I think, for this is the recruiter model, where uh, recruiters will pay money to have access to students who are looking for jobs who want to make their information available to recruiters. And right. this is a win-win for the students as well as for us if recruiters are getting valuable. We, we, have, to, we have to wind this up, so I need a short answer, but if, it's, if it can be done accurately, briefly, which is unless universities get on board with this kind of mass model, aren't they doomed? Um, I don't think they're doomed. I think there are... Lots of things that universities can do that we can't do as an online class. Um, there are universities that are smart about this and are, are starting to think about how to improve what they do by taking advantage of what can be done in the online format, but really also taking advantage of the things that they're uniquely qualified to do. And there is still certainly a lot of value to have one-on-one -on -one interactions with faculty. And for universities that can provide that kind of environment, um, they're going to survive. They're going to thrive. Um, the, Universities that don't adapt and figure out ways to do things that are, are uniquely better, that take advantage of what they can do and, and do better than what, what's available as a free online course, um, well, that they're going to have a, a tougher time surviving. But I think the elite universities um, are, are not in danger. Thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. On to Africa. You've probably seen the video. More than 90 million people have. It's called Kony 2012 about the murderous Ugandan rebel leader, Joseph Kony. It was produced by Jason Russell to raise awareness and political pressure to arrest Kony. It's a powerful half hour and controversial too. Here is a brief glimpse. For 26 years, Kony has been kidnapping children into his rebel group, the LRA. turning the girls into sex slaves, and the boys into child soldiers. He makes them mutilate people's faces, and he forces them to kill their own parents. And this is not just a few children. 
It's been over 30,000 of them. And Jacob was one of those children. As if Coney's crimes aren't bad enough, he is not fighting for any cause, but only to maintain his power. He is not supported by anyone, and he has repeatedly used peace talks to rearm and murder again and again. Coney, different times, proposed peace and then just regain strength and attack. This is the head prosecutor for the International Criminal Court. In 2002, when the court was started, their job was to find and demand the arrest of the world's worst criminals. Although there are a lot of warlords, murderers, and dictators in the world, the perversity of Coney's crimes made him first on the court's list. Two minutes of the half-hour video, Coney, 2012. What do human rights activists and policy experts think of this video? Is it misleading? And does awareness through social networking and videos lead to action? To begin the conversation, Sarah Morgan joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. She's with the Center for American Progress Peace Building Initiative. She was staff director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on African Affairs and was a policy advisor in the past for Oxfam. Welcome to the program. Thanks. Good to be here. Now, um, you know, 90 million people have seen this video, um, and I know that um, there's been a lot of criticism around, but are there any central or important critical corrections that you think are important to understand before we discuss the wider question of po what, what to do and the matter of policy and U.S. policy toward Africa? Sure. I think that, you know, I've worked with the Invisible Children for a while, and, and they do have a tendency to cut corners to get their messages out. Uh, it's certainly a challenge to translate complex foreign policy issues to, you know, quick, sparky activist messages. I think they probably could have been clearer about the size of the Lord's Resistance Army right now. Uh, they could have been clearer about its location. It's not in northern Uganda. And while the uh, video does show a small map, they could have been explicit about where it is located at this time or where we, we think it is. Uh, if they're trying to rally the troops and inform the uninformed, so to speak, being really clear about that type of information is important to inspire smart activism. It looks like all those kids are captive at once, too, the many thousands, and really it's, right. it's sort of over right. time, right? Exactly. I mean, no. the, the, other, the other final point I would just make is that there hasn't been any official uh, statement from the Obama administration that the military advisors on the ground in Central Africa will be redeployed at the end of the year. So while it's great to encourage them to stay, um, there is no consensus or official comments that they will, in fact, be removed. Right. Now, th th there's the criticism. What about the s strengths of, of this? It seems to me a wonderful thing that 90 million people would want to see a documentary or even, even a broadside about anything, and it was available to so many people. Yeah, I mean, it's been absolutely incredible to watch this video go viral. And I've worked on the LRA issue since at least 2005 and have visited the region a couple of times in different capacities. And to have all kinds of people from all walks of life talking about the LRA and suddenly knowing who Joseph Kony is is tremendously important. So the awareness raising is a tremendously vital first step to moving the policy uh, forward. But it's clearly not the only step. Yeah, let's talk about the other steps. And well, yeah. and first about these 100 advisors who, um, I assume they're not trying to find a guy in Uganda who's actually now in the Eastern Congo. Uh, my understanding, uh, based on what the president uh, put forward uh, in his letter is that he has sent 100 military advisors to the region to provide assistance to the Ugandan forces that are there, uh, particularly with regards to communica communication and intelligence, which is one of the reasons they've had such trouble catching Kony over the years. Right. D tell me wh what policy uh, steps should be done. Now there's awareness. What should people hope for, push for, what should be done, and who should participate? Sure. The first you know, thing to think about this video is obviously geared, in my opinion, towards the U.S. government, towards the halls of Congress sure. and the West Wing. Um, and so the question is not only what can the U.S. 
government, the, the Obama administration, do directly, but what, what kind of support can they marshal? Um, we do have the military advisors on the ground right now, but certainly there can be some expansion and greater support from other countries, both on the intelligence uh, gathering, information sharing, and communication. Um, there have been calls from some of the advocacy groups for helicopters, although I know that there's a global shortage of helicopters, which makes that one very, very difficult. Uh, the African Union has a really important role to play, uh, both on the diplomatic and the development side. And this is where I think we can see the U.S. really balance out the strategy, if you will. On the development um, side? On the development and the diplomatic side. I think a greater push to get the regional governments talking on a regular and consistent basis is tremendously important. And does important. America have that kind of clout that it can do that in, in, in this African situation? Uh, in some cases, yes. I think we certainly still have that clout with the government of Uganda, uh, with the Congolese government, uh, which is going through its own internal um, Sure. problems right now. You know, we may have less than we did, but we can certainly marshal all our resources to do that. And we can bring together some of our other partners, both in the region and out of the region, uh, whether it be government and, or non-governmental um, support. But getting Congo and Uganda to talk again uh, on a regular basis would be very important. Um, you know, there's also very important steps on creating a defection strategy. Uh, right, you know, to, the, to, get, to get, get these young people out of the Children's Army, you mean? That's exactly right. Capturing Kony and the other senior leaders, getting them off the battlefield is a really important first step. Um, but dealing with the other combatants, the, the lower rank and file, the younger people who, who have been indoctrinated. Right, and, you, and, and demilitarizing them and getting them exactly. you know, back getting into them civilian back, life. Right, and giving them opportunities. I, I wish we had more time because well, I could see this as, as not just demilitarizing, but an enormous job of trying to de-traumatize a lot of kids. Yes, yes, yeah. psychosocial assistance is critical. Exactly. Thank you for your time. I wish we had more. Sure, happy to talk. Good. Before Jason Russell's Coney 2012 video went viral, there was Lisa Shannon and her efforts to make a difference in Africa. Who is she? Let's begin with a glimpse of Shannon's first visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hi, here I am on the border of Congo. Um, behind me is the border from Rwanda to Congo. Uh, we're about to cross over into the world's deadliest conflict. We are diving right in uh, in order to meet people uh, in Congo, meet women who have been sponsored through Run for Congo Women. I'm not sure what to expect at this point, but I'm excited to be here. I had heard when you cross the border into Congo, the look in people's eyes changes. Why did I invite that place in? Why did I pursue it? We love you, and we know in America that women, all of you, are the future of Congo. I think back on the last five weeks. Who am I against Congo? I feel ridiculous. My hurling antics at this country's problems has been like tossing teaspoons of water on a raging fire. And even the children thought that the camera was a gun. So it makes people very tense when they see us show up with military, and yet I would not come here without them. We hike toward the forest, toward the Antara Hamway. Something has turned. Suddenly, we all know we've gone too far and are tempting fate. Fate did not strike her down. But how did Lisa Shannon come to tempt it? She had a good life in Portland, Oregon, successful business, nice house, fiance. But about seven years ago, watching not a viral video, but Oprah, she learned that millions had already died in the Democratic Republic of Congo and that rape and torture were occurring in shocking numbers. She decided to do something about it. At first, it was just a fundraising run, 30 miles solo. 
but it grew into the grassroots group Run for Congo Women, which has raised $11 million and helped an estimated 66,000 women and children. And now she has started the advocacy group called A Thousand Sisters to try to stop mass atrocities worldwide. Lisa Shannon joins us via Skype from Portland, Oregon. Honor to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. Good. Um, did you, by the way, we're not going to talk about uh, Coney 2012 for more than a minute, but did you have an initial reaction when you heard about it or saw it? Well, I did because I've spent a lot of time in LRA-affected Dungu. Um, I lived there for about a month with a close friend whose family lives there. They've lost about 17 family members in the conflict and had another six uh, children abducted. So, uh, nieces and nephews. So, I'm intimately acquainted with the very real human cost of Coney's actions there. And I, I support the effort, mostly because everyone I interviewed, I asked them, what would you like the world to hear from you? What would you like to say to the world? Um, and all of them said, get rid of the LRA. You've got to get rid of Coney. So, for me, um, it seems like a no-brainer that the international community would do what they can to uh, to bring this man to justice. Right. Is 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 that still the central threat um, in uh, Uganda and Eastern Congo? I mean, a lot of people have said, you know, this is a, a problem, but you know, there's, there's a lot of other problems that need to be dealt with as well. Well, I, I mean, it's that's right. I, I mean, it depends on the area that you're talking about. I've spent a lot of time in eastern Congo, sort of close to the border with Rwanda, and I've also spent time in northeastern Congo. For the people in northeastern Congo, the LRA is having a tremendous effect. Um, people massively displaced, unable to farm their fields. Um, uh, you know, lots of attacks, ongoing instability. So it's a very real, very serious problem. It is certainly not Congo's only problem. Um, I think what you see in Congo uh, overall is uh, a failed government and security forces that prey on their own people, particularly women. So there are a lot of systemic problems that, that go back to the Congolese government, and there's a lot that the international community can do on, on that front as well. All right, now let's turn to, to your work. In the little part of the video we saw, which I assume was from back in 2006 or something in that area. 2007, 2008. Right, yeah. right. Um, you talked about, you know, who am I to you know, sort of be hurling your little teaspoons of water at a raging fire, and, yeah. and yet somehow or another uh, it turned out to be quite a good fire hose, and it, it's done a lot of fine work. How did you get from that teaspoon to that fire hose? You know, I think that activism is a leap of faith. I mean, I started Run for Congo Women with just me running, mm. <laughs> but it grew into, into a movement. I, I set a goal my second year of uh, raising a million dollars, <laughs> uh, and five years later, I had not reached that goal. Uh, but then due to some media uh, that we received, we raised about six million dollars in a week. Right. I, think, I think the nature of, of, of the beast with activism is showing up and giving it your very best effort and trusting that somehow that's going to matter because it's the right thing to do. But I think more often than not, the moments that we're showing up or putting ourselves out there in a meaningful way are moments that we're going to feel silly or overexposed or like we don't know what we're doing. And often we don't know what we're doing. It's easy to say the wrong thing or stumble. But I have grown to feel it's our responsibility to show up anyway and, and, and give it our best effort, and that somehow that ends up working out. So right. um, I, I think that leap of faith and not waiting to feel like you know exactly how it's going to go or that you're going to have a guaranteed outcome is essential. It seemed to me watching this video that um, you, you not only brought resources to these women, but it seemed like a kind of love and hope. Yeah. Um, did that surprise you, the reaction you got? Because, you know, at first blush, you might have thought you know, a white woman is going to go, you know, 8,000 miles out of her way um, to, to help people. It's just, you know, the white man's burden. And, and yet right. it, it didn't work out that way. What did you learn about, about helping people and about going to Africa? You know, I did not know what to expect going in. I think it's one of the tricky things, the program that I support, Women for Women International, uh, have, have a letter exchange that you do with women, and, and it always feels silly uh, sitting down to write a letter to a woman who you know has to lived one, through... To one person. That's the way Women for Women International right. works, right? one person. Um, 
you feel like, what could I, what could I say in the face of what she's lived through that would matter? But in yes. fact, for women who have been treated like they are not human beings, I mean, for a lot of the women, it was the first time anybody had kind of asked them about themselves or wanted to talk with them and hear more from them. Um, in some ways, it kind of didn't matter what was said. It was the gesture of just showing up and extending um, yes. friendship. And, and, you know, it's interesting. I saw a documentary um, a few years ago called Worse Than War, and uh, it was basically covering the history of genocide since World War II. And, and the filmmaker made the point that if we want to stop these atrocities, we have to do two things. One is change the cost benefit for perpetrators because it pays in one form or another bad behavior like this. You know, someone's done the analysis and it pays. There's no punishment. Um, but secondly, we need to get people here to treat it as though it's happening to our own family. Um, and I think anything that we can do to form those kind of personal connections that help us flip on our empathy switch and keep the empathy switch flipped on is exactly what's missing. And that's um, certain, and certainly what Coney uh, 212 did and your videos and your work, uh, you know, connects, makes them, oh, these are people like me. This could have happened to my daughter. Right. You know, or, yeah. my, or my mom. It, your group uses its, its power and money on two levels to help individuals, but also on the matter of policy yeah. and trying to, to stop these kind of horrors from happening, not, not just in, 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 uh, in Congo, but in, in the world. Tell, yeah. me about, tell me about that next step you're trying to take and, and what your thoughts are about policy. How do you affect governments? What do you want them to do? Well, I mean, we have to treat women's security like it is essential, not an optional extra. And, you know, I think if the United States, for instance, is sending Congo a billion dollars a year in aid, but that aid is uncoordinated and makes no demands on the Congolese government. You say that, if, but in fact, we are sending them a billion dollars a year, right? Oh, we are. We are sending them a billion dollars a year, but we do not, we do not leverage that, those funds to make sure that the Congolese army um, isn't attacking women. Um, you know, there are known war criminals that are still, you know, paid staff. Um, so, so that needs to be cleaned up. Um, in terms of scaling worldwide, my concern has consistently been who are people on the planet who have been most marginalized, most ignored, who have we just written off? And so recently, uh, we actually just launched the first sexual violence crisis center in Mogadishu. I went to Mogadishu in July last year, uh, just prior to the news of the famine um, uh, hitting international head headlines. And th through working with local partners, which, which is a new point of focus for I, me. I have to break in there because I know that <laughs> local partners is key and we have, we have sadly gone from discussing rape here at home and in Canada and in now, now Africa. A, a sad yeah. and perfect circle, unfortunately, on our program. But thanks for uh, joining us. I wish we had more well, time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And that's it for this week's show. We roll out a new episode Wednesday nights at 7.30 or see us anytime at cuny.tv. Brian will be back next week. I'm Marty Goldenson. Thanks for watching.